Hello folks and welcome to the channel or welcome back to the channel and in this video we're going to be looking at the TVR 3000M cooling system and as you can see I already have taken off the bonnet or the hood so we have easier access to all the parts that we need to look at on the cooling system so first of all I'm going to take you through the uh, different parts of the cooling system then how it operates and then we'll talk about and we do some tests on how we can correct the problems on how we can find faults and to begin with, we've got our standard radiator, which is just fitted underneath the spare wheel. And this is a single flow radiator. In other words, water comes in on one side, cycles through it from the top down to the bottom through the channels and then back out in the back. The cooling system on the TVR is pretty simple. We have a overflow tank on the left hand side. We've got an expansion tank on the right. We have our radiator and then we have the water pump which is all the way down there driven by the belt driven of course by the crankshaft and then we have the thermostat housing which is sitting over here um, and the hoses going back into the expansion tank and from the bottom of the expansion tank we go in back actually to the radiator on the top water flows through it comes back out on the bottom and is fed back into the water pump and then it's pushed into the engine block itself with an extra hose in the back going to your uh, heating compartment uh, for your um, driver's area or your cockpit. The overflow tank is fitted on the left hand side and the tank is actually containing excess cooling liquid. So whenever the cooling liquid in the car or the engine is getting hot it's going to expand and because it's expanding the volume increases. And to compensate for this expansion when it's hot and the shrinkage of the volume when the cooling liquid gets cold, we need to catch that uh, variation and that's why we have this uh, overflow tank. Interesting to see is that the overflow tank has a special cap. And the cap on the overflow tank is actually what we call a pressure relief uh, cap. And there's a number on it printed, it's either 1-3, that actually means a 13 PSI a release valve that's inside. So if you open that up, you will see that this is actually spring loaded. And if pressure builds up in the cooling system, then it will actually start to open up the spring as soon as we have reached 13 psi of pressure in the cooling system. This is very important because a cooling system has to be running under pressure. And we know when you apply pressure to a cooling liquid that the boiling point is going to be increased. And the last thing you want in your car is that you get boiling cooling liquid. That's why a pressure relief valve is very important. Cooling liquids have changed over time. And at around the year 2000, the use of distilled water with glycol uh, as we all used to do, was changed to more pre-prepared, pre-fabricated cooling liquids, which have different substances in it. And I have one right here. You don't need to mix this with water. You can just pour it into the engine block. It cools very well. It allows higher temperatures, but at the same time, it is a protective layer inside the engine block and all that. So it protects against corrosion and it has a better cooling effect. The only problem with these uh, newer products is that they actually uh, create more pressure in the cooling system. And a 13 PSI release cap might not be that suitable anymore. Uh, you might want to fit a 16 PSI release cap uh, to allow this cooling liquid really to be more efficient. But again, it all depends on how you're going to fill up your system with a cooling liquid. The long metal cylinder that we have right here, this is what we call the expansion tank. This allows the cooling liquid to expand when it gets hot and to shrink when it gets cold. And the overflow of this tank is actually going to the overflow tank. Uh, never remove this cap when the engine is hot. Now this cap is a non-vented cap. In other words, this has to be sealed completely. So you cannot have any pressure relief on this uh, top side of this um, expansion tank. So keep that in mind. If you're going to put new caps up, that this has to be a total sealed cap. The water pump is all the way on the right hand side of the engine block. If you sit in the car and it's driven by this pulley, you can easily remove it. And in the next video, I'm going to replace the water pump 
There is a big hose coming from the radiator on the bottom side to fill up the water pump and then the pump pumps it into the engine block. In the back of the pump you have a smaller hose going actually to your heater for your passengers or your driver's compartment. Under this cover we have actually the heater for the cockpit. Uh, water is coming in from uh, the water pump, cycles through it and then goes back actually into the cooling system. Uh, you see this ugly aluminum tube on here, somebody put that on there, so that's not right. It will change that. But this is actually to suck in air, so you're going to get air coming in, being sucked in by a ventilator or by just the driving uh, force of the air. It will flow through that heat exchange of this radiator and then it warms up the cockpit. Nothing really special. Um, you got a little bleeding valve here, so you can actually bleed the system if you have to, especially if you're going to replace uh, the cooling liquid. On this car, I have a couple of fans sitting behind the radiator to provide extra cooling. I don't know if this is standard or not, uh, but we'll have a closer look uh, once we take the radiator out where those are. And these are controlled by a thermic switch. If you have fans on the radiator, they have to be activated at a certain moment in time when the temperature is getting too hot. And therefore, you have to have a sensor. Now, typically, you would find the sensor on the radiator itself or somewhere on the engine block, but in most cases, you'll see it on the radiator itself. In this case, they have an old-style sensor with a variable potentiometer, so you can actually adjust uh, the temperature at what time the relay will kick in to start up the fans and there is a sensor fed into the tube here on the side um, this is a very old system I would say I don't even know if I'm going to keep this or not I probably will go for a sensor right on to the um, radiator itself to trigger the fans but of course this has the advantage that you can actually adjust it and set it the way you want to set it at what temperature you want them to kick in and finally, we have what we call the thermostat housing. And inside, we have a thermostat. So the thermostat uh, in this car is supposed to be an 88 degree centigrade thermostat, meaning that when the engine is cold, the thermostat is closed. So the valve is closed, so no water can be pumped through the radiator to allow the water in the engine to warm up. In other words, to have the engine at operating temperature. Once the water reaches 88 degrees centigrade, the thermostat will open up gradually and it will feed the water through the hose back to the radiator to be cooled. So, so far we looked up all the different elements that make up the cooling system of the TVR and we talked a bit about its operation. So now um, I'm going to take you through a way on how I am troubleshooting a cooling system in a very simple way with doing a few simple tests. And then actually I will have to start fixing this specific TVR because I know this one has a couple of problems. So let's start with some static tests first to see how things work. So we're going to be checking if the thermostat is working. We're going to do a physical inspection of all the hoses. And then we're going to do some pressure testing to see if the release cap is working properly, if that 13 PSI is actually working. And we're going to do a pressure test on the actual cooling system itself. So let's start. The first thing that I always do is check that all the hoses are in a good condition. Just look around, see if you see any sweating. Now this doesn't look particularly nice over here, so I think I have a little bit of sweating here. Not sure what it is, but we'll check at it later. But check all the hoses, check all the bands on it that nowhere anything is loose. Check that all the caps are the right caps. And while you're checking the hoses, look at this guy right here. See how loose that is? This is actually broken. The tube inside is no longer connected to the housing. So I'm going to have a leak here. I know this for sure. So the pressurized system can't work on this car properly because of this. So this is something we will have to check. And in fact, look at this. Look what happens. I can even pull it out. So this is absolutely no good and has to be repaired. Check the core of the radiator that it's not blocked by debris because then cooling will be affected, but also check for damage and potential leaks. And what I see right here is that this is all wet. So this is a leak. I have seen it before in the previous video, so we have some corrosion on it. So this is really no good. So we have to uh, get this radiator fixed somehow or replaced. Checking the thermostat is fairly simple. Uh, make sure that the engine is cold, then start up the engine and let it warm up slowly. 
keep an eye on your temperature gauge and feel this hose here, the hose which is coming from the thermostat housing into the expansion tank. Hold your hand on it. And when the engine is cold and you start it up and the engine is slowly getting heat or warmed up, warms up slowly, this hose should still feel reasonable cold. It should not start warming up. It should only start to warm up at around 88 degrees centigrade or whatever rating of um, thermostat you have inside. But once you reach that operating temperature of this engine, then you should start feeling the heat coming through this pipe. If you don't feel the heat at all coming through, then you have a thermostat which is seized, which is blocked, so you have to replace it. If uh, you get heat coming through from the start, so as soon as you start the engine and you feel this hose warming up at the same time with the engine uh, warming up, that means the thermostat is broken as well or somebody has removed the thermostat. So both cases are no good, so you would have to replace the thermostat. So we went through the very basic testing and inspection of the cooling system. So the next step is to start measuring the pressure and measuring the release caps if they are working properly. It's pretty cold, it's about zero degrees centigrade and I have the door open so I had to put my gloves on. But nevertheless, uh, the first test we're going to do now is to check this cap. Remember the cap, the 13 PSI relief cap that is on the overflow tank? And to do that, you're going to need a small tool. And you can get these tools very cheap on the internet. It comes in a big box and I'll show it to you in a few minutes. But all what it is is a pressure pump and a dial or a gauge. And then an adapter, you can actually put your cap onto that. So it seals off like it's on the actual uh, overflow tank. And on the other side, uh, we'll put in a attachment so we can put pressure into this plastic adapter here. And let me just put that on and see. There we go. So now that I have put those two parts together, I can now pressurize this little black container and see at what pressure this valve or this uh, cap is releasing. It should be around 13 PSI, right? Because that's what the writing says. If it doesn't do that, then the cap is no good. If it does it earlier or later, change the cap. So let me hook that up and try to keep it all in place. It might be a little bit tricky with the cold here. All right, so I'm gonna pump now the pressure up, okay? It's gonna take a bit of time. See, it's going up five PSI. I just need to pump and pump. I've got 10 PSI. Now I'm at 13 and I keep pumping, right? And I can't go any further because it's releasing pressure, I can tell. See, it goes up to 14. So basically the cap is holding pressure and it's looking good. What we just saw was that the cap actually uh, allows pressure up to 13 PSI and then it starts releasing it. So this cap is, is working. So I'm gonna put it back on the overflow tank because we are done with this. This is a very interesting toolkit, um, which is very cheap as well. And it's very comprehensive, it's very complete. You got all kinds of adapters in it that you can use to check out uh, your cooling system by putting pressure onto your engine and your cooling system itself. And we'll do that in a few seconds. It also comes with the pump, as you've seen, to check your uh, release cap, and it comes with a filling mechanism, so you can actually fill up your system or your cooling system uh, with vacuum. So you suck vacuum first, and then you're going to suck in the cooling liquid. I'm going to show you that later on when I'm refilling the car after we replace the radiator. Imagine that you haven't found any bad hoses or bad connectors or no leaks whatsoever then uh, you could still have a leak somewhere internal into the engine. Maybe you have a little bit of white smoke, maybe you might not even notice it, but if you have to keep topping up your cooling liquid, then something is certainly wrong. And then it's good to do a pressure test. And to do a pressure test, you remove your pressure relief cap on the car, and actually then you fit a, another cap onto it, which allows you to put pressure into the system, and that's the one. And then I'm going to pump this up to about 13, 14 PSI, and I will see if it's gonna hold that pressure or not. Now, in my case, that ain't gonna happen because this hose is broken, so I'm gonna lose pressure right away over here. So first of all, I need to fix this tank to be able to show you this test. So let me do that first, and then uh, we do the test. 
Well, this hose doesn't look too good either. It's cracked, so I might as well cut it off and then get it cleaned the other way around and then put a new hose up. There we go. I'm gonna try to fix this tube. So it's still a bit hot, so I need to pull this guy out to the right level. So we'll probably need to put it in like this and then brace it into place. But before I can do so, I will really need to clean this up uh, a bit better. So let's wipe it clean. So I finished up hard soldering that tube back onto the reservoir. So now we can actually do a pressure test. So I'm going to connect one of these adapters to put pressure into the overflow reservoir and then we will pump it up and see what happens. So now we are about ready to put some pressure onto the system and I'm gonna pump it up to about 13, 14 PSI and then see if we have any leaks anywhere. This is also a good test to see if any of your hoses are leaking under higher pressure. And we're gonna check the radiator because I suspect there we have a leak and maybe we'll have some leaks somewhere else. Now, obviously I had to fix this reservoir first and that's what we've done. So now we can actually go and test that. So let me hook it up and then we're going to pump it up. So I'm about ready to start pumping it up. It's gonna take a little bit of time until we have the pressure because everything is empty. But we get there. You can see the needle going up. 5 PSI. Oh, now it's going better. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. And I'm going to leave it here at around 13, a little bit more. So now we have 14 PSI and I'm going to leave it sitting here for a while and see what happens. Uh, in fact, it's only 12. I'm just going to give it a little bit more. It doesn't hurt to give it a bit more. All right. So let's see. Now, let's inspect a few things on the car while we have the pressure up. Now, you can see it's not falling very fast, so it's not too bad, but I still expect a few leaks. So let's look for the leaks. So this is the first place. I spotted some leaks, so coming out of the hoses. So these hoses are leaking. Uh, so either we need to tighten them down, in fact this is loose, so or we have to replace the bands that are on it, but this is how you can spot it. Um, so this is no good, we need to fix this. So let's look somewhere else, where else we see some drips. And as you can tell, the radiator is also leaking, and that's of course what we expected, so we need to change the radiator out for sure. And... The hose coming from the radiator, going back to the water pump, also is leaking. And it's because it's been rubbing, most likely on the chassis here, and probably it has punctured a hole in the tube, so that tube will have to be replaced. Well, I've been looking a little bit closer, and it's not actually a puncture of the tube. It's actually coming uh, from the connection to the water pump. Now five minutes have passed and the pressure is already down to about 11 and a half PSI. And that's just because of the leaks we have. With a pressure test, you can detect far more problems than just doing a quick check while the engine is running at temperature. Um, we spotted that the leaks were actually on the radiator and we knew that already. But we also spotted a couple of other leaks and mainly around the bands that are holding the tubes onto the connection pieces. So all these bands I will replace and of course we'll double check the tubes where they are connected. So now let's lift up the car and drain the cooling liquid and remove the radiator because that one has to go for repair or replacement. All right, so we're gonna drain the cooling system. I'm gonna remove all the caps because that will make it easier. And then I'm gonna open up 
the draining valve on the back of the radiator and I'm just going to let it run out. And while it's draining, have a look on the color of the cooling liquid. Now this looks pretty good, uh, but if it has a different color or it has a lot of pollution in it, then you have another problem. Uh, maybe you have an oil leak or something somewhere. So now it's time to uh, connect the main radiator hose on the bottom of the radiator. This is actually the feed into the water pump, so the cooled side. And I suspect we'll have a lot of water coming out of this pipe now. Uh, So this side is a bit different. This is part of the expansion tank and it's actually a solid tube. So you only have one short rubber piece here. So we're going to try to disconnect this. Uh, I'm not sure if how easy that will be uh, because I don't have a lot of play. So I might have to do it uh, while I'm pulling out the radiator. So let's do that and um, see how that goes. There's one bolt we need to undo here and then there's two split pins on the bottom of this radiator and then it should actually come out. All right, so let us undo that bolt on the top. That's a socket 11, or at least that's what I put on it. Now on the bottom, you have two studs on the radiator and this one has a very El Cheapo split pin in it to hold the radiator in place. So much debris and dirt on this. Here we go, and that's now free. So this is the uh, big washer I was referring to. All right, so I got the hoses disconnected on all sides. The bolt is disconnected, yep. So now I should be able to lift this guy out. Yeah, there we go, and lift it up. But as you can see, it seems that this radiator is broken. All right, so let me put it on the side here for now. And these other two fans I was referring to before that have been mounted most likely afterwards uh, to provide extra cooling onto the uh, radiator. Uh, it's a bit awkward that there's no shroud around it because that's what I typically would expect, but okay, it is what it is. The chassis looks a bit tacky, but it's solid, so that's a good thing. It's just surface rust, nothing really serious. Right. And as you can see, the radiator has had its best time, so even the side came off. Um, so now I have to make a decision what I'm going to do with this. Am I going to get this repaired, get it replaced? In other words, getting a new core in the middle, keep it copper, or will I go to an aluminum radiator? Lots of options to choose from. And I've been watching and looking at a lot of forums, and I talked to a lot of the Facebook pages on the TVR guys and to some shops as well and what I noticed is that um, you know there's always the discussion should you go for copper should you go for aluminum now I think an aluminum radiator has a lot of advantages it's light it's strong and it has a far better cooling efficiency most of the time because of the way it's been built because the material is a bit thinner so it is easier to you know give away its heat um, copper is a bit different although copper is a very good conductor for heat, um, still aluminum is better and you will find aluminum uh, radiators uh, in most sports and track cars. Uh, however, um, when I looked on the prices on the internet, I see a big price difference and they look the same, but you can't really tell where they are built. Maybe they're cheap uh, Chinese versions and I'm not interested in Chinese crap. I want to have a decent radiator in my car so I spoke with a few guys that are in the UK that are building the radiators themselves. Some build it from scratch all by themselves. Some probably assemble just some, and I wouldn't be surprised, but I'm not sure, of course. Uh, it's up to them to comment on that, that the core, which is this middle part here, might even be Chinese import, and they just build, actually, the uh, channels on the sides around it. Um, I don't know. Uh, it's something to be thinking about it. I'm going to take this radiator to my local radiator repair shop, which is a guy who has 30 years of experience, and I will ask for his advice before I make a decision on which radiator to get. Now, this radiator is kind of interesting. It has actually four channels running down like this. Right? Small tubes that are going from the two, between the two sides, and these four channels 
That is not really optimum. It's quite different uh, on aluminum radiators. You will see far less channels. I actually have here a uh, Lotus Elise aluminum race radiator, and there you only have one channel going from the left to the right. Uh, of course, there are multiple channels. I think this is an original TVR uh, radiator, and you can see that it has one, two, three, four channels. It may be a little bit hard to see for you, but if you look closely enough, you can see those four tubes. This is better if these tubes are bigger, but with copper, typically, you have these smaller tubes. The horizontal lines that you see, these are the channels through which the cooling liquid travels to get cooled down. And the fins are this zigzag uh, element here. These are very thin, thin copper elements. Now, they are pretty far away from each other. And this is always the, the art. I mean, how close should they be? The closer they are, the better cooling you get, but also the less airflow you get through it. So there's always a balance between that. Now, this is an aluminum radiator from a Lotus Elise, and you can actually see that the fins are much closer to each other, and this has a much better cooling efficiency. Also, there's only one channel instead of four. Now, of course, the radiator is a lot thinner, but still, um, you can see the difference in build. So let's have a peek inside the aluminum radiator, and you can see that slit there, that opening. That is actually a white channel, and this is only one channel versus four channels on the copper one. Now, obviously, this radiator is thinner uh, as the other one, but still, uh, you will see wider channels. We are at the end of this video, and I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, please comment by all means, because um, I always uh, am keen to learn from all of you. Uh, in the next video, we're going to replace the water pump, we're going to replace the thermostat, and we will be installing the new radiator and fixing the hoses and the spanners that were bad on this car. In between, I might even start a video on the exhaust because that's coming very soon. I just received the new headers. I'm still waiting for some heat wrap, uh, but once I have that, then we work on the exhaust. And I'm still waiting for some parts uh, to fix the leaks on the engine, the carter or the sump, as you call it. And the rocker covers, uh, that's another area we need to repair the seals and adjust the valves and then do a lot of other maintenance actions on this car to get it in a fairly decent running mechanical condition. So keep watching.